lightweight battle tonight. So um, to start off, this is how we're going to register. So if you guys go to this address, there's a form. It's a Google form. And you'll see on there for you to enter your email and then what classes you're in. And then whether you think all drugs should be legal. Yes or no. How do you feel coming into the debate? Should all drugs be legal? So we're going to have two professors debating both sides of that argument. And so initially, we want to see where the crowd stands on the debate. Should drugs be legal? Should all drugs? We're talking cocaine, heroin, uh, LSD, oxycodone. They got to get some oxy every once in a while. Might have a pain or two that you need to tend to. All drugs, should they be legal?
for a shirt toss. Uh, 
so what I want to help you understand is, so I'm going to try to narrow things down so that it's a little bit simpler to kind of think through your thoughts on all of this. So if a drug that you think is relatively harmless, okay, think of a drug that you think is relatively harmless, but it's also illegal. Okay? So if you can think of a drug that's relatively harmless, and I can convince you that actually that drug is a lot worse than you think it is, okay, then maybe the other drugs that you think are really bad, maybe it would make sense for some of those to be illegal. Right? So something you think is not a big deal, it's not really that harmful, maybe I can convince you that it is more harmful than you think it is, then the really bad ones, maybe it should be illegal. So I wanna say a few things about uh, how we can evaluate whether this, these drugs should be legal. So first of all, um, a drug does not, drug use does not just affect one person. But even if it did, right, we have seatbelt laws. Right? And those seatbelt laws incentivize you to wear your seatbelt when you might otherwise not wear your seatbelt. Right? So one way to think about the legality of these drugs is to think about an economic argument. If these drugs are legalized, that will decrease the cost of producing them. Right? It's very risky to produce drugs when they're illegal. So that will increase the supply of them and it will also increase the demand for those drugs because people that um, might not have otherwise used them if they were illegal will now potentially want to use them. So we'll get a lot more of that drug use. The second one is that um, when we make something legal, and we have seen this with one the drug I wanna focus on, which is marijuana. So as we have seen in the US, some states legalizing marijuana the particular way it has been legalized has led to some interesting consequences. So people will often use an analogy to uh, making alcohol illegal, right, back in the 20s or something. Um, and that had all kinds of effects on the, the potency of the drug itself, the alcohol that people consume. So legalization has actually increased the potency of marijuana. And this is very dangerous because of the second um, issue, which is a physical issue. Use of marijuana by teens who are genetically predisposed to schizophrenia have a much higher probability of developing schizophrenic system, symptoms with usage of marijuana. Schizophrenia is a horrible disease. It leads to um, 10 to 15% of people with schizophrenia successfully commit suicide every year. 60% of males with schizophrenia attempt suicide. So it's not a very safe type of thing. If you have are predisposed to schizophrenia, then these drugs, this drug makes it a lot worse. And there's a second, uh, the, the final argument is political. Sometimes in life, we like to think that there are second chances, right? We mess up, maybe we go bankrupt, we lose all our money, we can start over, right? We get a bad grade on a test, we can try harder on the next one. But sometimes there are no second chances. And Specifically with legalizing drugs, there's probably not going to be a second chance. If you get a tattoo of Justin Bieber on your cheek, it's probably going to affect you the rest of your life, right? It's not coming out. So I'll go into this a little bit more as I go, but consider that there might not be a second chance if you legalize drugs. Okay, you're going into crossfire. You can ask questions back and forth. Um, do you want him to ask the first question? Okay, that's fine. Uh, you have around eight minutes, so be good. The two of us? Yeah. Back and forth. Would you like to start? Sure, I'll go ahead. So I have a question about with something you said at the beginning. You said um, hunt down people and use, you know, and, and take them at gunpoint um, and all this sort of thing. So do you think that making something illegal necessarily implies something about the way we carry out that illegality? For instance, where driving without your seatbelt is illegal, but that doesn't imply that we hunt people down at gunpoint and put them in prison for the rest of their lives just because they don't wear their seatbelt. Well, if you resist wearing your seatbelt for long enough, they'll kill you. Okay. But 
how many cases would you say that that entails? Like, so is it legal to, to, wear your, to, to not wear your seatbelt? But for most of the people who don't wear their seatbelt, they put their seatbelt on and they go about their day, right? Yeah, and cars on the table look coming against seatbelt laws too. And I, this is somebody, I would never, ever, ever get in a car without putting on my seatbelt. Um, but I don't think that it's the government's right or responsibility to tell you to put on your seatbelt and to make you wear it. The same with motorcycle helmets. So in Kansas, you're not required to wear a motorcycle helmet. Um, I have a bunch of friends that ride motorcycles without motorcycle helmets, and I think they're stupid for doing so. But I mean, where I got my, my motorcycle license in California, I had to wear helmets all the time. I resented the fact that I had to wear one, even though when I owned a motorcycle in Kansas, I never rode it without it. So um, I generally reject the paternalist argument in principle. I guess that's my answer. Your turn. Oh. <laughs> uh, is it your contention that marijuana is actually worse for the user than alcohol? I don't think so necessarily. I mean, I don't. I don't really know. I mean, this is this is a great example, I think, of the no second chance issue. Is that because you know alcohol was legal at some point, then. Back in the day, a long time ago, we tried to make it illegal, and it didn't work out because everybody freaked out about it, right? And so once now, now we have what, 40,000 people dying every year on the roads because they have easy access to alcohol. Now sure, driving with alcohol is illegal, but the point is we've already made it so that the cost of producing alcohol is low and the demand for it's very high. And so we've already sort of gone down that road and we can't turn around. So I think alcohol is a great, example of my point, which is that be very careful when, when you know, previous wisdom says that there should be some kind of restriction on this. If you take the restriction away, you may never be able to put it back. And so if something goes wrong, you're in trouble. Yeah, this is something I'm going to get back to a little bit later about second chances. Um, we have in 2000, it was a little over 500,000. Now it's a little less than 500,000. It's still going to happen. In jail, whose most serious crime is a drug related offense. They're not getting the second chance. So, if you want to talk about second chances. So, are you asking me a question? Yes. Uh, do you consider their second chance as important as this hypothetical second chance that the state isn't going to get? To yeah, so the way I would respond to that is to say that the particular means of enforcement of the laws don't necessarily have anything to do with the illegality itself, right? So driving without your seatbelt can be illegal, so can shooting somebody for fun, right? And the means with which we use to uh, find those people, um, you know, go about arresting them, putting them somewhere in jail maybe, or maybe we you know, have some kind of more harsh punishment for them. In other words, the punishment and the means of apprehending the criminal or the fine we impose on them doesn't necessarily have anything to do with whether or not it's legal. So it's a separate question in my mind. So I, I have another question. So you, um, and it was interesting again, I think, when you talk about um, this hunting and the gunpoint thing. So I guess I'll kind of flip it back on you. Like, do you think there's something inherent about whether I make something illegal that says that I must use maximum force? Or, or in empirical reality, in the way things normally work, do we normally have uh, you know, somewhat reasonable enforcement of most laws? Well, if we're going to answer that question, we should talk about the enforcement of the actual drug laws. And they are enforced at gunpoint. We had known off raids that come in the middle of the night where you know kids get their you know, cheeks blown off. So I am talking about the way the laws are actually enforced now. If you're going to say, well, we should have this different hypothetical state that'll enforce the laws that I want in this way. I think, to me, that seems a little bit like dodging the question. So, so that's a question for you. Sure. Is your argument essentially that drugs harm the users to a certain degree, and that things that are harmful to users to that degree ought to be prohibited by the state? 
Yeah, I think that there is a degree of wisdom that has to be exercised on the punishment for certain things and the prohibitions we put on different substances. So caffeine may harm you by increasing your blood pressure or something like that, but the harm of that is small enough that sort of normal, perennial, just the average person on the street would say that, okay, well, it shouldn't be illegal just because it might raise your blood pressure a little bit. But certainly the more dangerous drugs like methamphetamines or crack or heroin are incredibly dangerous and they devastate people. So it's not necessarily just a matter of, you know, on average what the harm is across the entire population. It's these concrete cases of people whose lives are just completely ruined by these substances. And so if we're going, like I said, and it hasn't been contested, if we're going to reduce the cost of production of these things and increase the demand for them, I mean, we're going to have a big problem on our hands. So my question sort of related to that is if we legalize all drugs tomorrow, we just repeal all the laws and here we go, do you know what will happen? And if you don't, then what makes you think that just repealing them all, the cost of that will outweigh the benefits, if there are any benefits? Well, surely you have to admit that it is a cost of at least half a million people who are in jail whose primary and most heinous offense is drug possession. So alleviating that cost would be huge in my mind. Secondly, we know that, for instance, Portugal used to have the highest rate of heroin overdose in the EU, and then they decriminalized the use of all drugs, which isn't full legalization, but it is a step away from full illegality. And they had a huge drop in the amount of overdose deaths. Some studies said that they actually had a lowering of the use of heroin too, and some other studies seem to indicate that the use stayed the same. But if what we're really worried about is people dying, then it would seem like we have at least some evidence that making drugs not illegal reduces overdose deaths. Okay. Justin, you get to start. Six minutes. So I'm here going to outline two bad arguments that we often hear for drug prohibition. I'm going to explain why these arguments don't work and what exactly I think is wrong with them. Then I'm going to outline what I claim is a good argument against drug prohibition. Then Levi will talk, and since I'm going first, he's probably going to skillfully avoid all the traps I'm trying to set for him, but of course I hope he won't be able to do so. So here's one argument we usually see from prohibitionists. Drugs. Drug use is very harmful to users. The government should prohibit people from doing things that harm themselves, and therefore the government should prohibit drug use. Now, you'll notice that that second premise, the government should prohibit people from doing things that harm themselves, that's doing all the work in this argument. And there are big problems with it. Riding motorcycles, skydiving, again, moving to Florida, maybe even something like agreeing to publicly argue for complete drug legalization. All of these things might turn out to harm you in some way or be imprudent. But they aren't the kinds of things that the government should prohibit you from doing. Are you, is it right for the government to prohibit you from staying with a boyfriend or girlfriend that's emotionally abusive? Is it right for the government to prohibit you from cheating on a boyfriend or girlfriend? So, here's another argument that you will often get from prohibitionists, which is that drug use harms people other than drug users. They'll say things like, but it isn't just drug users who get harmed. Drug use harms people's families. And they say, since drug use harms people other than users, the government should prohibit people from doing things that harm others. Therefore, the government should prohibit drug use. The problem with this argument is either the first premise or the second premise. Does drug use harm people other than the users? Sure, it does. 
You can become addicted to a drug and break into somebody's house and, house and burglarize them. Or you can uh, get addicted to drugs and you can start being a jerk to your friends and family. You can stop calling your mother. You can drop out of school. Uh, you can take dead end menial jobs and just kind of drift from place to place. In both those cases, you're hurting people that are other than, other than yourselves. Now, the problem is that uh, if the harm in question is like breaking into somebody else's house and burglarizing them, we have laws against that. And so that's already illegal. You can already be more accountable for that. So let's talk about the second case, because um, this gets brought up a lot by people who say, well, drug use can ruin families. Uh, and surely it can. Um, but I can wake up tomorrow and decide not to call my mother. I can quit this job. I can start living a drifter's life and then, you know, uh, move all around and take dead end jobs. It's not illegal for me to do that. It's not illegal for me to turn myself into a loser. And if it's not illegal, and it shouldn't be the state's responsibility from permitting me to voluntarily turn myself into a loser for sure, then it sh the state should not be permitted to forbid me from taking a substance which only has a slight chance of turning me into a loser. So, um, those are two arguments that you usually hear for dro drug prohibition. Here's an argument um, against drug prohibition. And both those arguments and the argument that I'm about to give here are taken from uh, the philosopher Michael Humer. So, um, just uh, fair warning, these aren't my own. So, um, the drug war is unjust because we are actually punishing people for exercising their rights. Philosopher Doug Husack, who's another philosopher, has argued that drug prohibition is the greatest injustice perpetuated by the United States since slavery. That's not hyperbole. In 2006, there were half a million people in prisons and jails whose most serious offense was a drug offense. In addition to punishing people for exercising their rights, um, if you own your body, then when you are taking a drug, you are exercising the right to the control and use of your body. So, I'm saying, that's right, you have a natural right to use drugs. You have a responsibility not to. But if you own your body, you have a right to use it as you choose. On this view, you have a right to the use of the control and use of your body. If it seems like you have any rights at all, you have this right. And this right explains a lot of common sense morality. It explains why rape, kidnapping, and battery are wrong. Why we don't think you should be used in medical experiments against your will. This actually even explains both sides of the abortion debate very well. Pro-choicers think that a woman has a right to do whatever she wants to her body, while pro-lifers think that the fetus is a person and the woman therefore does not have the right to control what happens to the body of the fetus. So the argument formally works like this. You have a right to the control of use of your body in the manner that you have the right to control of your other property. Drug use is, for reasons described above, a legitimate exercise of the control and use of your body. The state has no business prohibiting you from exercising a legitimate use of your body, and therefore the state has no business prohibiting any drug use. Thank you. Okay, so I want to kind of get back to something I started saying at the beginning, which was this issue of no second chances. And I want to reiterate that the means of uh, enforcing a law are not the same thing as whether or not that law uh, should exist. So um, I'm not sure that many of you remember this time, but in the mid-1990s, no highways in the US allow people to drive faster than 55 miles an hour. And now, you know, it's 85 in some places, somewhere in between, right? And the issue is that of those 40,000 deaths per year on the road, thousands of them can be attributed to the fact that you're allowed to drive faster than 55 miles an hour. So can you imagine now, 25 years later, we're gonna reimpose a 55 mile an hour speed limit on the highway? Nobody would sit for it, right? Even though it would save thousands of lives. So I think this makes, uh, this is very important for us to think about because if 
we reduce our control over people's behavior in some areas, then we can have highly negative consequences that we don't foresee beforehand, right? So somebody might have said, hey, we can't let speed limits go up above 55, this is crazy, right? But obviously, the voices that said, it's no big deal, won, right? And slowly, speed limits crept up. And so every one of those people that died because people were driving too fast, you know, and this is their own body, right? It's my own body, it's my own car. Why can't I drive as fast as I want, right? Why can't, I, why can't you reduce the restrictions on me, right? So this fits perfectly within the framework that were offered, but we can see that maybe the consequences of it, we couldn't perceive them, right? We were sort of looking through foggy glasses, right? And we don't get a second chance. We can't reimpose a 55 mile an hour speed limit. For all those people who are genetically predisposed to schizophrenia, they certainly don't need any help in how bad their life is going to get, right? So they don't need someone telling them that it's no big deal to use a substance that is certainly going to hurt them. Now, I'm stipulating it's a small group of people, but we don't know who those people are ahead of time. And if we allow everyone access to this substance, then certainly kids are gonna get it more often. All right? We saw this with cigarettes, right? You have to be 16 to smoke cigarettes. Well, I mean, before it became uncool to smoke cigarettes, right? People would smoke them when they were 14 and whenever they wanted, right? They're easily available. This issue of harm is also kind of interesting because, sure, you have the right to turn yourself into a loser, but that doesn't mean that there aren't uh, means for the rest of us and potentially the government to try to help you not become a loser and you know give up on your family, right? Maybe your desire to quit your job and all that stuff is because you're depressed, right? And so maybe we need to provide uh, uh, some kind of assistance to help you not be so depressed, right? So that's just one means of dealing with one potential condition that might turn you into a loser and ruin your family. But in the case of drugs, it's potentially the case that just helping you isn't enough. So we also need to, on the front end, restrain that behavior, decrease the supply and increase the cost of usage. And this goes back to the Portugal example. It was decriminalized. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is they made possession of it, basic, of any drug, basically like getting a speeding ticket or parking in the wrong spot, right? So there was still a cost attached to using it and getting caught, but they weren't gonna put you in jail for it, right? And on the other side, on the supply side of that market, the laws are still in place. It's still illegal for you to traffic drugs and all that sort of thing. If you have large quantities of drugs, you are not allowed to move them around. So there's still a supply restriction in place, even with something like decriminalization. So I guess what I'm advocating for is just exercising a bit of wisdom that you might not really know what might happen if we repeal all laws against the use of dangerous substances. It's very hard to know what could happen. Sure, there are problems with the way this law is enforced, but legalizing, legalizing them all is sort of like killing a fly with a sledgehammer. There might be more reasonable means of dealing with the problem of police abuse, et cetera, et cetera, which are separate issues. And I, I'll yield the rest of my time to this officer. Okay, so now we're into audience Q&A. Okay, so I'm going like to have you guys share a mic, and then let me take this mic stand. So if you guys have a question, uh, I would like Justin, to come up, and I'd like Jacob Coddell to come up here. So where you can meet Jacob Coddell is our... This year, our 
undergraduate scholar that got a scholarship for the Gortney Institute, and he is modeling the shirts I hold in my hand. And so you check out the back, it's pretty awesome. So who's got a question for either one of these two to pose? Come on up, come on up to the microphone. We need you up here. Here's a little shirt for your trouble. If you want to ask a question, just so throw a line. People with questions, make a line now. Just one. Go ahead. Okay. All right, quiet down. When the, uh, when the speed limit was raised from 55 miles per hour uh, to whatever it is now, do you have proof that the death toll was increased? Yeah, the, the study that I read basically said that we're going to look at the same highways and control for the amount of traffic, right? Because maybe more traffic means more fatalities, right? So we're going to control for uh, the, the, the amount of traffic on those roads, the width of the roads, uh, the, you know, how big the shoulder is, and all of that sort of thing. So it's, uh, I would say a fairly sophisticated econometric type study that controls for everything that at least we can have any, uh, at least we think might also have increased deaths. But when that law was passed to increase those speed limits, we had more deaths. Can you list the source of your study, please? I can't. <laughs> but I'll get it to you later. Hit me up in class. Yes. Yes. Okay. Justin, any comments? Just for the record, I can't list any of my sources now either. So that's <laughs> All right. What are we, professors? All right, next question here. Hey, take a shirt. There we go. Anybody else? Yeah, get behind the next person. You guys can make a line of three, four people, whatever. Go for it. Um, are there like any economic benefits like like tax like is there going to be like a certain tax on the legalization of drugs like there is with the states that legalize marijuana or is it just going to be like street drugs like they are now? So is this question for me? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I don't know because believe it or not, nobody has put me in charge of this. Uh, <laughs> so I don't have a rollout plan, but um, I would imagine that uh, something like uh, taxing them and regulating them the same way the state regulates alcohol um, would be something that I would consider uh, a step forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Levi, any comments? That's still not legalization. Just <laughs> so my question is kind of for both of you. So we touched on the topic of, you know, the government has the right or doesn't have the right to keep you from becoming a loser. Well, when we look at this and we look at you know, legalizing drugs, all of that would have to go through our government and ultimately our House of Representatives and go through the legalization process. So constitutionally, do you believe the government has a right to step in? It's for both of you. Constitutionally, well, so, um, you know, I, uh, I'm an economist, so uh, I don't really know much about the, the, the way all these laws work. But, You're very um, yeah, well, yeah, sorry. Well, yeah. But we still have lawyers. Uh, I mean, like, I, you know, I think it's, if, if we have, look, the way we have drug laws is we have uh, the Commerce Clause. So there are probably laws that a lot of people like that were justified by the Commerce Clause over the last 200 or so years. And so I think it's perfectly reasonable for the federal government to have those laws if they affect interstate commerce, because that's in the Constitution. If I recall correctly, um, the alcohol laws were repealed because they were ruled unconstitutional. So if we are kind of putting us in the same area, then would that still apply? Well, as, soon, as long as there is interstate commerce, then, I mean, you can't just take a bottle of wine from Kansas and ship it to Missouri, right? Can you do that? Not illegal? Oh, well, you know. Doesn't mean it shouldn't be illegal. So I want to comment a little bit on what you guys said in the last sentence, which is it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be illegal. And uh, what I want to stress is that that is what we are arguing here. Whether or not drugs should or should not be illegal, um, not exactly whether or not it falls under the Commerce Clause or not. We both know that the government is going to interpret the Commerce Clause so widely that it affects you know, how I fold my underwear. But uh, the question is whether or not the question is whether or not the government ought to regulate drugs. All right, next question. Okay, this is for Levi. 
Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, your argument against the legalization of marijuana was that it, it would be bad for people with schizophrenia, right? Okay, so by going by that same logic, when you make fatty foods illegal for people with heart diseases so they don't have heart attacks or something like that. Uh, yeah, so it doesn't mean that, again, I, I think we, we treat different things differently and that's okay. But the problem is when something is extremely harmful and cannot be used to any good effect, right? And even when we try, right, we try to make medicinal marijuana, okay, all we do is make it more potent. So uh, it, it's not like, we're, we're not treating them the same because they're not the same. So analogies can only get us so far when we're deciding whether or not something should be legal or not. Can I, can I say something? Okay, so you say, because it's only harmful for schizophrenia, but by that same logic, like I said, fatty foods are bad for people with heart Okay, so the other way I could argue, I could make a point okay. about this is that fatty foods are already legal, uh -huh. and like I've said, there's no set of chances. We can't go back anyway. Okay. My point is, we are on the brink. If we take this step, we can't go back. So we should be very careful about the steps we take, because we can't go back. <laughs> So my question's for uh, Levi. So we're talking about the, uh, sorry, but we're talking about the uh, the safety of marijuana and stuff like that. Um, there's like a really big issue, especially in our age group right now, of people buying black market, like THC cartridges, and it's been killing people because it has vitamin E inside of it, and that's like really toxic to you. So don't you think that if we were to legalize it, the FDA or whatever could actually regulate that so that way we don't get any of the harmful stuff that's actually killing people? If anything, it would be more safer for the government to have their hands in it. Well, I, I think the evidence is the other direction because in places where we have legalized it for explicitly for pharmaceutical uses, right? Pharmaceuticals are highly regulated. They're legal, but they're highly regulated, right? All we have seen is an increase in the potency of the drugs. So it wasn't like uh, alcohol prohibition 100 years ago when the quality of the alcohol just went down the drain, right? And literally we had bathtub gin, right? It, it's actually gone the other direction. And so now you have this super potent, so yeah, okay, vitamin E, fine. But I mean, I'm not against just, you know, making that illegal too, right? Yeah, it's not really the potency that I'm arguing for, it's that people are doing this illegally, so they have nobody watching over them. So they're putting- they're Sure, like, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that the, the fact that it's deadlier, right? And it's a black market drug, that's what you're saying, right? Well, what I'm saying is that even when you make it legal, it still has a, a more negative effect on the person physically because it's more potent. So it's, it's not exactly the same thing, but they both have the same effect. They're both killing people faster. Okay, I'm gonna let Justin last comment there. Sorry guys, we're out of time. Sure, but uh, the fact that the marijuana itself becomes more potent doesn't mean it's less quality or that it has less quality. And uh, you can still, with extremely potent marijuana, have to smoke something like three or four garbage bags full of it in order to kill yourself. Um, which is So you don't care about schizophrenics? <laughs> to our last rounds here, Jason. Okay, so Levi, you've got three minutes. Okay, so in my closing statement, I would just like to say that wisdom requires us to be cautious about big changes in big issues like the use of drugs. I've tried to say that a drug that most people, especially people probably your age, think is totally harmless, right? Actually has some seriously negative effects, especially for people who are already vulnerable, okay? So, if you've accepted any of my points about caution itself, about the lack of knowledge we have about what happens when we open the floodgates for all the other things we think are actually really bad, that when that happens, 
right? When we make the cost of production lower and we get a lot more heroin and a lot more meth than we already have, and we lower the cost of people using it because we're not prohibiting them anymore, the demand increases, we get a lot more methamphetamines, a lot more heroin, and a lot more crack, and we don't actually know what's gonna happen next. So, legalizing, remember, the question is whether or not we should legalize all drugs, not just the one I've been talking about the most. So, if you think that my caution to you about the economic choices, the potential harm on vulnerable populations by all of these substances, and the issue about wisdom and our lack of prediction, our lack of ability to predict what will happen, and our inability to go back. If that affects you at all, right, remember, it, then you have to agree with me and say that we shouldn't legalize all drugs. Maybe some of them should stay illegal. And that would mean you would have to vote for me. Next time. Four more years. I'll yield my time. I think that was rhetorically tough enough. All right. Four minutes. Uh, as of 2006, 45% of Americans over the age of 12 reported having used at least one illegal drug. Bill Clinton, Al Gore, Newt Gingrich, Clarence Thomas, and Barack Obama have all admitted using illegal drugs. George W. Bush declined to answer, but come on, he's drugs. <laughs> What's the difference between the President, Speaker of the House, Supreme Court Justice, and someone who gets killed in jail or whose record is hard and must squeak by in life because of a felony drug conviction? The answer, and the difference, is luck. I have a friend from college who had to go to rehab for heroin. He's a surgeon now. He didn't get caught. I have another friend who was charged with having psilocybin. And his court date was when, I don't know, we were 18, and we were starting college, and he was going to have to go to court that September, and it was September 11th, 2001, and his court date got thrown out. He is now a lot more money than I am. He didn't get caught. If this group is representative of the nation as a whole, about half of you have tried an illegal drug. If you're in here, you probably didn't get caught, or at least not by the police maybe your parents caught you, or you weren't prosecuted. You should think of your friends, your potential children, and your siblings. Suppose one of them did get addicted to a hard drug. Would you want to call the police on them, or would you want to put them in rehab? I know that I would want to put my son, my brother, in rehab. This for the record, is one of the reasons why Portugal's death rate from overdoses goes down after they decriminalize. You are uh, more likely to get help when admitting that you are a user isn't a felony. We spend over $47 billion a year on the drug war. That's money we could be spending trying to help people who have serious drug problems instead of treating them like violent criminals and locking them up with people who have committed violent crimes for doing nothing other than what about half of Americans do anyway, and just being unlucky about it. We have absolutely nothing to show for our efforts at prohibition. Now, I know the schizophrenic example has been brought up a couple of times. Um, I'm not so sure how well schizophrenics do in prison, but I would imagine it's a lot worse than normal inmates. This drug war is a disaster, and this ridiculous war and legalize all drugs.
different address for you to uh, log into. And then we're going to tabulate the votes and see who took the belt. So the jihad belt. Kings. Welcome, sir. It's a pleasure. Pleasure's over. Please make sure you vote on the screen to your left. Okay, we've almost got her done now. Hold tight here. You didn't figure it out. Okay, we have the results in, everybody. If we can dim the music here. So, at the beginning, we had 63% of the vote going with Levi. That drugs should not be legal, not all drugs should be legal. After the debate, his percentage dropped to 51, making the new heavyweight champion of the world, Dr. Justin Super Clark. We have a book club coming up that we'll be sending out some information on. You can 
earn 50 bucks by reading a book. 50 bucks by reading a book.